Folks, in this time that we live in, we need the Lord. And sometimes it's easy to forget about Him, but we need Him. As we uh, move away from our missions conference, we're going back to our theme that we started or we were in. If you could stand and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, and we will continue on the theme of living in victory. And this morning we will continue on that. And you go to uh, 1 John in the end of your Bible, chapter 5. Look at verse 1 and to verse 5. And the Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we, love, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this great passage of Scripture. Some people might confuse this passage, but Lord, what a words of victory for the Christian. We can over overcome this world. We can overcome this world system. We can live in, a v in victory in, a in such a sinful world. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here this morning or even on social media following us this morning that never received Jesus as Savior, may today they call upon you for salvation. And for your people, for your children, I pray, Father, give us strength. And Lord, remind us, Lord, that we don't live in defeat. We live in victory because, Lord, we are more than conquerors in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue our a series on living in victory. And tonight, I would encourage you to be here. We continue in our series, Winners. And the series tonight is about the end times. What the Bible has to say about the last days. But today we're looking at, this morning we're looking at uh, living in victory. Now let me put it like this. We don't live in defeat. As Christians, we live in victory. We might look like a minority, which we are. In this world, we are a minority. But let me tell you, we are not, not to live in, vi in, in defeat. We live in victory. The Bible says we more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Listen, we know the end of the story. All right? I put it like this. You go on to watch the Patriots. Please don't watch the Patriots today. Okay. <laughs> They're going to lose. But anyway. <laughs> well, let me you watch, you, you want to watch your, the Patriots. Let's put Brady is still there. So you're going to watch the Patriots. And you don't have time to watch the Patriots. So you pre-record the game. You don't want nobody to tell you what was the result. But somehow somebody sneak it out and say, oh, they win, you know. And they tell you the number and you go, oh. But anyway, you go home and you go watch the game. And it seems like, man, man they're really doing bad. But you know the end result. You already, you already know that they went in the end. So even though you struggle with that, you go, oh my goodness. But in the end, you know, I know they're going to win. That's the life of the Christian. We know that in the end, we will win. We are winners in Christ Jesus. This world will be going away with extreme heat. And let me tell you, this world will pass away. But let me tell you, we will be with him for all eternity. And the people of this world say, well, that's not true. Oh, well, keep believing a lie because that's what the Bible teaches. Okay. All right, we will, we will, it will be strange if, if, if this morning I'll say to you that we Christians live in a world that is, listen to this, anti-God, anti-church, anti-Christian people. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, believe because it's true. Okay? Actually, I think that it is strange, a strange way to start a message. <laughs> but in reality, I just said the truth to you. If the world would expect, the, uh, if the world would accept the gospel message, let me tell you this, churches would be full, Bibles would be open, in the home, God would be welcome. I'm talking about in your home, God will be welcome. I mean, the Bible will be read, read in our homes if we will accept the gospel message. The problem is, most people in this world don't. Accept the gospel message. If the world would receive Jesus' message, then the world would be a much better place to live. 
If the world would receive the gospel message with an open mind and an open heart, churches would be full of people. The world would be a much better place, like I said, to live. People would be more kind, loving, forgiving with one another. People would care more about others than, uh, than themselves. People treat each other with respect and, and the dignity that they deserve to be treated. No matter what culture, what language, or the color of your skin, nations would be in constant peace with one another. Husbands and wives would love each other more, and the home would be a place with, uh, of a little heaven. Jails would be empty. Murders and abortion would be part of the past. But let me tell you, rape and sex trafficking would be no more. But unfortunately, folks, we don't live in a world like that. We live in a world where sin abounds, with wickedness abounds, and when the heart of man is desperately wicked. And you say, well, I'm not a wicked person. According to the Bible, all of us are. When we look at each other and say, oh, I'm not that bad of a person. I, I, I would say the same thing about myself. But according to the Bible, well, our goodness is nothing but filthy rags. Folks, I just give you a snapshot of a few gross sins that goes on in our society each and every day. Let me tell you, every, let me tell you put it like this. Hear me. You might agree or disagree with me, but I have to say this. We're so concerned about people dying of COVID-19. I understand that. Uh, a person that dies is a person that dies and his value in life. But we're not so concerned about abortion. Where little children are murdered every day, not just in America, throughout the world. Listen, we're killing the innocent. And it's okay. And we call him a fetus. Listen, it's not a fetus. It's a human life. And it's put it there by God Almighty. But we are so concerned about one, but we're not concerned about the other. Hypocrisy at the high level. It's the world. We live in a world where sin abounds. Listen, let me tell you this. What we see today through social media, news, internet, and TV is people who are lost in sin. Their actions reveal the conditions of their hearts. Now, how can you and I experience victory living in a world where sin abounds? Folks, we cannot experience victory if we individually try to, to, to handle or to live in the middle of the fence and say, today I live for God, tomorrow I live for myself. It can not work that way because let me tell you, like, when you do that, you will be defeated. Listen, do you have a society or, 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 uh, 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 that wants to defeat you, that wants to mold you and shape you to the way they think? And if you don't think the way they think, they crucify you, so to speak. You have a flash that loves the pleasures of life. And you have Satan that is very real. That wants to destroy you, destroy your home, destroy you as a person individually. Folks, we cannot experience victory if we individually are trying to, to stand on the fence, in the middle of the fence. That is impossible. Listen, what says in 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, For Demas... Uh, as a Demas is a name, at forsaking me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalon Thessalonica. And let me tell you, this is Paul speaking. Paul said, this is a brother that lived with me, that walked with me, served with me, but he's no longer. He turned his mind towards the world, and he went his way. He departed from me. And let me tell you, through the ages, or through the, through the years, me as a Christian, I've seen many people doing that. They put the Bible in their, somewhere in their house. They leave church. They leave their, 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 the God that they love. And they say, oh, I'm going to live for myself. And many of them make a mess out of their lives. Listen, I've seen Christians went to, to, and went to prison. I've seen Christians that made a mess out of their lives. What does it mean when we walk about gaining victory over the world? The Greek word used in, in 1 John 5, 4 for the, for, the word, for the world is the word cosmos here. In this context, uh, the world means the present condition of human affairs in opposition to God. It is not hard for us to realize that we, uh, what we see around us, uh, uh, as far as the world system is concerned, is in opposition to the truth of God. This is nothing new. Listen, since, since the world has been around, there's always opposition to God. When Jesus was in this world, people opposed him. Read the Gospels. They pick up stones to stone him. 
They wanted to kill him. It's always opposition to the word of God. Even today, if people oppose you because of what you believe, or the way you live your life, don't be, don't be surprised. Because the world system is against God and his church and his people. Actually, today, many parts of the world, you can't even go to a church. It's against the law. Why is that? Why some, some religions, they have freedom to do what they want, but Christianity doesn't? Because it's opposition to the truth. It brings conviction to the heart of man. Because you see, if we're going to live according to what God says in his word, guess what? The world's going to change. The people of this world's going to change. When are you going to think different? The greed that is in the heart of man will vanish away. And let me tell you, we live in a system, in a world that is driven by greed. And people think life is about me, myself, and I, not about you. So I can step on your head and do what I want because I, uh, my heart is full of greed. That's the world that we live in. How can we as Christians live in such a world and experience victory? Let me tell you. If you're fearful right now about this time we live in, as a Christian, I feel bad for you. Listen, this is not a time to feel afraid. And Listen, our faith should be stronger than our fears. Amen. He said, well, but you don't know I can contrain the disease and die. Listen, then you go home. Why are you so afraid to go home? God is there. Jesus is there. The saints of all ages are there. I'm going home to be with my family. Why so everybody's afraid of dying? We're all going to die anywhere. I'm not trying to scare you this morning, but it's the truth. We're all going to die. It's the reality. You don't die one thing, you die of another. But the reality is, how can I live in victory in a world that so presses against what I believe? Why, why can I live, how can I have victory in a world that's always pushing and pressing against me and try to mold me to, for the way they think? You can through the ages, there have been many people that did. Number one, let me give you a couple points. Faith in God's purpose. Look at verse 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory. Look at the words. Don't miss that. That overcometh the world, even what? Our faith. Amen. To overcome the, the pull of this world, we need to have faith in the plan that, uh, and, 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 in the plan and, pur- and purpose of God. When we feel the thug and the, and the temptation that goes away from God, we must realize that God has a plan for every trial and every challenge of our faith. Let me tell you, this is a time right now, COVID-19, for us to put our faith into practice. Amen. I'm not saying to go around what, what the governor says or, go, or, or, or forget about that or, or just be rebellious. I'm saying we have to be wise and at the same time practice our faith. Yep. Right. What opportunity to tell the lost world, listen, you, you are so afraid of dying, you're so afraid of, of, of COVID-19, you're so afraid of that. What a good opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because ultimately, listen, if they, die of, if they die of this thing, guess what? They die, they will be lost for eternity. Yep. Listen, folks, there is a real heaven. There is a real hell. Amen. I know when we are angry at people, we say go to hell because we're angry and frustrated. But let me tell you, that place, hell, is a real place where people go. And I tell you why, you don't want to go there. Many times in the midst of difficult situation, people lose sight of the Lord. Many times in the midst of difficult situation, people lose sight of what God is and what God's doing, working in their lives, trying to accomplish something in their lives. Let me tell you something. John the Baptist, the man who said to be equal among, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, among them that are born of a woman, well, that's what the Bible says. Among them that are born of a woman, there was, was no one equal like him. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Needed to uh, remind that God had a plan for him as well. Being imprisoned by Herod made him question if Jesus really was the Messiah. John wasn't, was, the, uh, uh, was the one who announced it, says, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Wasn't he? Wasn't he that stood up and said, look, pointed at Jesus, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But when circumstances, when problems of life arrived to this man, guess what? Now he's questioning. What happened to John? What happened to John's faith? What happened to the man who was outspoken for God? What happened to John happens to all of us. 
It can happen to all of us. And let me tell you, we can say, God is good. God loves me. Uh, I live in victory. But in, that's when everything is wonderful. I have a job. I got money in the bank. I got a nice car. I have health. I have nobody sick in the home. Everything is wonderful. But when a problem arrives, where is God? And sometimes we even blame him for it. John the Baptist, the man that said, look, that's Jesus. That's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. He was on top of it. He was, he was boldly preaching. He was, he was going at it. But when he was in prison, he saw his condition. Because he knew he was not going to get out of that place. And he lost his head in there. And let me tell you, in that situation, he lost it. What was John's faith? Let me ask you today. As a Christian, where's your faith? Listen, we live in trial times. Don't get me wrong. Yep. We live in a, we don't, I mean, everybody's pushing. One says one thing, one says another thing, one says another thing. It is unbelievable what's going on in our world. But let me tell you, where is your faith? You like John the Baptist? Now you're questioning God? Listen, this is exciting times. Folks, listen, if you're a Christian here today, if you read your Bible, let me tell you this. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Read your Bible. Let me give you the books you should read. Go to Ezekiel, go to Daniel, go to Revelation. And you see what the Bible says about as time moves on. It's not going to get bad, it's going to get worse. So we shouldn't be surprised, it should be exciting because Jesus is coming again. Now John, harsh circumstances led him to question what he had once believed. Let me tell you. You go to work tomorrow, you are, you know, in victory and everything is wonderful. You go to work tomorrow and they give you a pink slip at work. What happened to your faith? You see, when circumstances are right and they're good, everything is wonderful. We can say, in God, good. Oh, God is great. Look what he's doing in my life. So you go to the, you begin to feel sick, you don't feel good, and you go to the doctor and the doctor said, I'm sorry, you have cancer. Now what do you do? You questioning God? John the Baptist did. The problem is, where is your faith? How strong is your faith? Listen, it is in challenging times. It is in hard times. It is in difficult times that our faith is put to test. It shows the measure of your faith during those times. Letter A, God's purpose is according to his timetable. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thy own understanding. Look what it says. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And look what it says. And he shall direct thy path. See, in this trying times, if we trust God, and if we put our faith in him and say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to trust you. Let me tell you, he says in his word, he promised in his word, that he will direct your path. Amen. The Lord have a purpose for each one of his children. His purpose for John the Baptist was to, for him to prepare the ways of the Lord. His purpose for Paul was for him to be a missionary to the Gentile world. His purpose the, for Moses was for him to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. His purpose for Joshua was for him to conquer the promised land. The interesting thing about the, uh, those guys that I just mentioned is that the Lord used them in his name because he had a purpose for them. What is the purpose for God for you today? And the general purpose for you is for you to be faithful, obedient to him, loving and forgiving. If we go into be victorious in the world that we need we need to allow the god uh, god's purpose to flourish or to flow through us a mature christian realize that god is always at work in the book uh, in, in his book experiencing god this man henry uh, talked about the importance of looking to see what god is doing in our lives in difficult times god is working just as surely as he is in easy times god is always at work the, problem, the thing is, the question is, how much are you trusting God each and every day? It's easy to say, I trust God. Hardest things to do is allow him to work it in us and through us. Let me tell you, we live in a world today, there's fear in every corner. Let me put it like this, you see if there's no fear. 
How in the world a person is driving a car by himself with a ma mask on? <laughs> All right. Is that common sense? I, I, I mean, listen, I'm not saying this in, in a facetious way. I'm saying, is, why in the world somebody is driving a car by himself with a mask on? Who's around that person to, 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 for that person to contaminate? All right? Secondly, you're walking in a park by yourself, walking your dog. Here you go down. And you have a mask on. What in the world is that? Fear. That's what it is. Yep. Fear overtake us, and we're so fearful that we will allow, we allow everything. Um, whatever you say, I do it. That's fear. Yep. Let me tell you, you have to be wise and intelligent. All right, so I'm going to the store. I put a mask on. I'll be, you know, make sure that, you know, I don't get it. I don't give it to anybody. I understand that. I'm in a place of work. I recommend that I do this. Okay. I have people in the car. Maybe I don't know who they are. I'll put a mask on. But when you're alone, that demonstrates fear. And let me tell you, that's when it comes about, where is your faith? Right. Listen, if we think that the air outside is going to get us sick, the air inside is going to get you sick too. Right. It's common sense. But fear drives us to extremes. Fear drives us to more extremes and more extremes. So if, I hope it doesn't come to a point where we're just going to board our, our, our doors and our windows and just lock ourselves in. But let me tell you, for the Christian, we are to live in faith, trusting God. Listen, I said this here before, I'm going to say it again. No one dies and catches God by surprise. Right. You get that? No one dies and catches God by surprise. This COVID-19 didn't get God by surprise. God already knows he's in the tomorrows. And let me tell you, God knows he's going to die tomorrow. He knows he's going to die today. He knows he's going to die the day after because he's, a, he's the one that gives life and takes life. Nobody dies out of time. God knows exactly when your day is called up. We try, you know, you can be in the best shape of your life and say, I go to the gym, I exercise, I eat healthy, I don't eat any meat, I eat salads every day. I'm just healthy as can be and drop dead. Life is fragile. Actually, the Bible says it's a vapor that appears for a time and it vanishes away. That's how life is. Folks, that's the reality of life. Let it be. God's purpose is always tr trustworthy. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they are not high-minded, no trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Folks, we all live in a world system that continually and forcefully is trying to shape us to its mold. In order for a child of God to experience victory over this world system, we must trust in God's purpose for, his, for this life. God's plan for our lives deserves our faith and confidence in Him. We can trust His love if we can trust His love, for it is so great that we will only give, He only give us His very best. Listen. God is not in the business or make your life miserable. He's not. He loves you. He cares about you. And he wants to, to blast you beyond measure. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I tell you what, if you grab this Bible, I mean your Bible, not this one, your Bible, all right? If you have the Bible and you read about the blessings of God, it's so many in here. And let me tell you, God wants you to have them all. But let me, you know what? Why we don't have them all? Because our lack of faith and our lack of lifestyle, the way we live, we miss it out. God wants to bless us. God wants to bless you with a long life. You know, and some people dry, uh, uh, dry uh, or die early. A lot of times as God says, I'm done with you, you lost your opportunity. You say, God does this? Yes, he does. Man. We live in a world today that says, well, God is love which he is. God loves everyone, which he does. Oh, God does not judge mental. Yes, he is. He's the judge of all the earth. Right. And if, we, we, if we, think, we think that's not true, read the Bible. Right. Because it's there. God says, and the Bible says in Genesis, shall not the judge of the earth do right. See, and then if he's a judge, he's going to judge according to his laws. And God have his laws. So we have here, we have faith in God's purpose. Number two, we have faith in God's precepts. 
First John 5, 5, the in our text says, For who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is what? The Son of God. So, okay, there are millions of people in this world. And let me tell you, um, now most, uh, most of them have been molded and shaped by the philosophies and the ways of this world. Unfortunately, some Christians have too. Listen, we live in a world system that continually, continually try to mold you to the way they think. You say, well, how do you, you know that? Let me tell you this. If you're from this culture, and this culture, and this culture, let me tell you, if you put them together, everybody thinks different. You follow that? I'll tell you what, so you don't believe that. Well, come to my, the Portuguese culture where I come from, and, and come with your culture see if we think different or not. You know why? Because I've been molded that way, you've been molded that way, and all of, all of us have been molded different ways. And let me tell you, that's the way the world system works. And unfortunately, Christians get sucked in and begin to think the same way. How can you and I have victory over this world? How can you and I live a life that is pleasing to God and you live in obedience to God in a world that continually try to shape you to its mold? You want to know how? It's very simple. First, you need Jesus as your Savior. Secondly, you need a book like this. Right. It's called the Bible. I was like, yeah, it's an old book. Oh, let me put it this. This is an encyclopedia. Is it really? It's like, where is it? It is a bunch of books in here, not just one book. Right. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and you get about 66 books in one. This is an encyclopedia here. That is the word of the living God. You know how the world will shape you when you begin to read God's word and live it. You say, well, nobody can live according to this book. Really? Yes, you can. You see, if you say that, you already, your mind's already been molded by the world. Yep, right. You're not living in victory, you're living in defeat. Yep. Can I live in this world as wicked as it is, and loving God and loving people? Yes, I can. Amen. Oh, but look at the people. Those people are so rude and unkind and, and mean. and like, yes, they are. But you don't have to be like them. You see that? I'll tell you what. I went to the golf course. I experienced this every time I go to the golf course. I said, well, the golf course is a nice place to go. It's peaceful, the trees, the grass. We hit the ball and we walk. Then you hit the ball again. Then you go, go somewhere, you can't find it. Then you go again. And it's like, it, you know, you practice patience. But you know what? I found the most rudest people in the golf course. Unkind, mean, and, and, and rude. It's like, I'm telling you. I, I, every time I go, I find one. It's not like I try to find them. They find me. They're there. Even make an argument with you in the middle of the field. I, one guy, the last time was, he was like, Sis, I just came here to play golf. Like, just go forward. Just leave me alone. Just, you know. But look, we live in a world like that. Can we have victory living in a world that is so unkind? Listen, you go down south. You see the different culture than up north. All right? You see people down south, they, they even, you go to the store, hi, honey, how you doing? And you look at them, and you're never like, well, I'm not your honey. But, but that's how the people talk. It's the kindness of people. You see, you come north, it's like, oh, oh, oh. the rudeness is everywhere. But let me tell you, can even either way you go, can you live a life that make a difference to these people? Yes, you can. Can you be kind? Yes, you can. Can you be loving? Yes, you can. Can you be forgiven? Yes, you can. So you can live in victory for Jesus in the midst of a wicked world. You can stop being polite. So when somebody's walking to you for, to the store, keep the door open. One time I went to the gym. And I know this lady was coming behind me. And, and I opened the door, let her in. And she walked in, indifferent. And I said, thank you for opening the door for me. And you're welcome. I said the whole thing, and she looked around and said, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I was like, well, you know, I, we, we're so used to that, even when we do kindness and good things to somebody, they don't even notice. But that's the world that we live in. See, folks, that's the system that we live in. Listen, but you and I can make a difference in this world that we live in. Listen, you can forgive. You can forgive. You can be kind. You can use kind words to people. You can treat people right and with dignity. Listen, it's the system that we live in that molds us and makes us think different than we should think. Listen, but when you open God's word and begin to study and, and look what God says, you're going to see it, God right here that wants you to be that kind of person. That's how you experience victory. 
I said, that person is mean to me, but you know what? I'm going to turn kindness. It's not easy to do. Somebody says something rude to you and you go, oh yeah, let me tell you what you need to hear. <laughs> right? That's, that, that's automatic. See, listen, God says turn evil with what? With good. That's what God says in his word too, evil with good. Who wants to do that? Nobody. But listen, when we don't respond that way, we are living in defeat, not in victory. A soft answer turns away wrath, the Bible says. You see, somebody comes to you and comes to you, put the finger right on your nose and tells you all kinds of despicable things and curse you to your face. And you know what? Oh, yeah? Take the shirt off. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. You know, I'm going to get even with you. How dare you talk to me that way? You know what the Bible says? A soft answer turns away red. You look, show more as a man by walking away from that situation than actually go at it. You've got to say, how in the world it shows strength and faith when you turn around? Listen, when they were persecuting Jesus before he went to Calvary's cross, what did he do? See the strength of Jesus? Yeah, the Bible says he did not even answer them. They were mocking him. They were making, calling all kinds of names to him. He would not even answer. It's like, the Bible says, like a sheep to the slaughter. He didn't say a word. Sometimes we think, and see, but listen, folks, that's the world we live in. Try to shape us to its mold. Letter A, trusting, God commands, uh, trusting God's command, commandments proves our love. Look what it says in Psalm 119.67. My soul had keep thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee. You see, we demonstrate our love for God when we trust and obey his commandments to, uh, uh, that are written in his word. And let me tell you, God says uh, we are to love the unlovable. God says we are to pray for our enemies. God says we are to be kind to people. Listen. By doing that, we experience victory and God continues to bless us. I'm not saying that somebody does something so mean to you that you forgive and everything. Oh, body, body's over here. I mean, you never did this. No. We learn from those things. But we have to have a forgiving heart. When we trust the, the word of God as our guide for living, he builds faith and confidence in our hearts that we have a God in whom we can trust to meet the challenges and temptations of this life. We can do that. Let it be trusting God's commandments provides us strength. Knowing Christ is our Savior and placing our confidence in the word of God gives us strength to overcome the world. So many Christians live in fear and doubt that they will not be able to defeat temptations. Brother White was here with him last week. He said to us, I said, how you overcome temptation? Listen, temptation is on every side. Let me put it to the guys to here to today. How often you go to the internet looking at pornography? Oh, it's just my thing. Really? You know what you do when you put things in your mind that shouldn't be there? Right. Right. You know what the God says to that is sin. It is a big industry. Thousands of people. Many marriages. Broke apart because of things like that. Pornography is a big sin. It's like cancer that spreads throughout the mind, to the heart, to the brain, and overtakes you. You say, What's okay? no, it's not okay. It's not okay. It breaks families apart. Let me tell you something, uh, sir. Talking about the guys here this, this morning. If it's not that bad, would your spouse watch it with you? What about your children? Oh, no. Well, then it's wrong, right? But I can, well, you know, understand. Listen, if you're going to live in victory, then you need to get rid of these things. He said, but I cannot resist. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can resist temptation. Yes, you can. A Christian who has the proper perspective of the Bible and God realizes the best yet to come. But let me tell you, you can come any temptation. You know what Brother White said? Nailed to the cross. I said, Lord, I have this temptation. I don't know how to overcome it. Give me the string. God says, nail to the cross. And that's what we need to do. What is your temptation this morning? I had no victory. God, listen, God wants you to live in victory. Why are you not experiencing victory in your life? It's your fault, not God's. Yeah. So what do you do with that? Listen, nail it to the cross. Yeah. So my problem is drinking. 
My problem is drugs. My problem is lost. My problem is pornography. Listen, nail it to the cross. And God will give you the strength to overcome it. See, if we just keep on excusing and excusing and excusing, the years going by, it gets worse and worse and worse, and there's no victory. It's always defeat. So number three, our last point, faith in God's person. Look what it says in verse uh, four there. For so have is born of God overcome the world, and this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. For he that overcome the world... But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So two times in this verse we see the word uh, overcome it. The question for me and you this morning is, uh, can we overcome and be victorious of this world system? Can we? Yes, we can. Jesus Christ is, is the overcomer. Jesus Christ overcame the world. And by his example, we can follow his footsteps. Listen, I want to read the verse and I'm going to ask you a question. Look what it says in John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, Jesus speaking, that in me he might have peace. In the, uh, in the world he shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Listen, what footsteps are you following? Is the question. That's uh, the verse I just read is John chapter 16, verse 33. So we gain the victory over the world only through Jesus. We must have faith in, in, well, have faith in the simple tr tr uh, truth that Jesus is the Savior and he has already purchased our victory for us. Let me tell you this. What footsteps are you following? Your peers, your friends, your co-workers, your culture, are you following Jesus? And let me tell you, don't you know for me to, to follow the Christian life, I have to kill or, or, or to overcome a lot of my cultural things? I said, really? I, yeah, I had to. Because the way the Portuguese culture is so ingrained, so uh, in Catholicism. And I'm not saying I'm not talking bad about Catholicism. I'm just saying that's what it is. And it was, when you look at the Bible, there's a lot of wrong in there. You have to die to those things. So we gain the victory over the world only through Jesus. He's the overcomer. He overcame the world. He overcame sin. And let me tell you this. He said to you and me, follow me. Folks, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have everything that we need to live a victorious life. I know that often we are pressed by the pressures of life. Our minds focus, uh, when we are pressed by that, our minds so just focus on those things. Let me tell you, you got a problem. I mean, I put it like this. Life is wonderful. You're sitting here, it's like, eh, hey, well, good message, it's wonderful, nice and warm. A seat is, it's very comfortable. It's great. I had my coffee this morning, my donut. It's wonderful. Life is great. God is good. You walk outside, somebody just hit your car. And it's gone. You know, pfft. then you have a big problem. You have to call the insurance company. You have to do this, you have to do that. And it's like you get overwhelmed, and guess what happened? Your mind gets submerged in that problem. You don't see nothing else but that problem. I put it this way. Years ago, my sister and I, we were at the beach. And it uh, was back in Portugal. And we were on those big rocks, and those waves were huge. But I was catching some uh, um, things there. I was on top of this rock, and... Uh, I was, my back was towards the ocean, and it's so loud I couldn't hear. And my sister looked at me. She's pointing at me and yelling. I was like, wow, wow. So when I look back, oh, my word. It was a mountain of water. I was like, I forgot everything but the water. I was like, oh, I thought I was going to die. I really did. So I hold for dear life in that rock, and I could hear that rush of water. And let me tell you, it sucked me out of that rock. And I went like tumble all the way to the shore, came back down and holding. And my sister, I could hear my sister ah, screaming. I thought, I got a couple scratches and stuff. And it was like, wow. See, that's the way sometimes when we have the problems of life, that's what we get to. We got so submerged into it, the only thing we see is that. And we don't see God in the midst of it. And we got all the scratches and bruises and we go ask, God, where were you in the midst of that? I needed you and you were not there. 
Like I was singing this morning, Lord, I need you in the midst of these troubles and trials of life. Let letter A there, we're almost done. Jesus is the anointed one. Look there in the verse, in our, our verses. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begot love him also, that is begotten of him. So John talked about believing that Jesus is the Christ. The name Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. So the cults and the false religions of that day denied the deity of Christ. The world in general denied the deity of Christ by seeing him as a symbol of religion, a good teacher, a good man, or a simple, or simply a prophet. The familiar story of the woman in the well gave us a clear testimony to the identity of Christ. Jesus was the Messiah and God in the flesh. In him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, according to uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. When we study the attributes of the life of Jesus, let me tell you this, we have everything we in Him to believe that He is the Christ, the Son of God, and also for us to pattern our life after Him. You want to have victory in your life? You want to have victory in this world that we live in today? Let me tell you, pattern your life after Jesus. But Jesus lived 2,020 years ago. Life was different then. Let me tell you this. We're so smart today, aren't we? Are we? We are smart today. We have all this technology and these things and this stuff, but the one thing that never changed. There's one thing in this world that never changed, continue the same. You know what it is? The heart of man. The heart of man never changed, continues to be the same. You know what? And Jesus said, pattern your heart and your mind after me, and you will be victorious in this world. Listen, you can be hurting here this morning. You can have health issues. You maybe don't have money to pay your bills. You don't have an, even have a place to lay your head. And let me tell you, even in the midst of all those problems, you can be victorious. Did I give you letter A on this passage? Jesus is the anointed one. Letter B, Jesus is the appointed one. Let it be. Why is the appointed one? Let me tell you why. He came to this world to die for your sin so you can go to heaven where he is. He came at an appointed time. He will come at an appointed time. But let me tell you, in the meantime, what are you doing with Jesus? You want to live in this world for yourself or you want to have one that say, listen, you can live in victory because I give you the strength, but more than that, I can give you heaven. I said, well, heaven is just a, well, you guy. Listen, heaven is a real place as hell is a real place. Listen, there's no purgatory in between. You show me the chapter and verse in the Bible which says that, I, I'll be believing that. But let me tell you, in the meantime, it is heaven, that is hell. You we either go one place or the other. Let me tell you like this. Nobody wants to go to hell. I don't care how wicked they seem to be. By the way, if you know right away, if you go to a funeral, everybody is good. I went to the funeral. I know this guy very well. He was my uncle, one of my uncles. And I know how he lived his life. In a funeral, oh, goodness, all the good things they were saying how good he was. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, am I in the right place? <laughs> Is that the right guy? And honestly, I walk. And my mother said, what are you doing? I said, I want to make sure that's the right person. I think I'm in the wrong place. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, listen, this guy is the greatest guy on earth. Everybody's good. You know what? Because in the end, everybody wants to go to heaven. But let me tell you, as good as you want to be, there is no heaven for good. You have to receive Jesus as your Savior. Look what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. You don't go to heaven by religion. You're going to have it by having your name in some church somewhere. You don't go to heaven by keeping the law and be a good citizen. These are all good things, but let me tell you this. It won't give you heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You must believe that he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of mankind. And listen, you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner. You have to acknowledge that you have broken God's law, that you are guilty before Him. You have to, listen to this, repent of your sin. Acknowledge to God that you are a sinner. Lord, forgive me. 
My kids sometimes just say, uh, you know, like, uh, forgive. oh, daddy, forgive me. Forgive you of what? Tell me what you're guilty of so I can forgive you. Let us see, Jesus is the all-powerful one. Folks, our victory comes from a source. That source is Jesus. Folks, the world may view us as weird, closed-minded, dangerous, but that is the world. Folks, we're not weird. We're not closed-minded. We're not hateful people. We're just common folks. Are you consider yourself a, 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 a weird person? Do you consider yourself a dangerous person? Well, that's the way that will qualify you and me today. Listen, we know what we do. We just love the Lord. We want to serve Him. We want to live for Him in a world that is so hostile against God, against God's people. We're not weird people. But look what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You understand that passage? It says the one that is in you is the Spirit of God, and the one that is in the world is Satan. And the Bible says, greater is it the one that is in you, may the Spirit of God is greater than Satan. And let me tell you, if you are lost here this morning, the Spirit of God is not in you. How you receive that? I conclude with this. Admit that you were sent it to God. Do business with him. My dad was in his death bed, dying of lung cancer. And my dad always refused. He had his religion. In that moment, I was there by myself with him. I got my chair close to him. And I said, Dad, don't you think it's time to make peace with God? And he said, yes. At that moment, my dad didn't rely on religion, didn't rely on good works. He needed Jesus. And like a few weeks before he died, he made peace with God. He called on Jesus to forgive him of his sins. I heard him. I heard him asking Jesus to forgive him. He said, Jesus, I've been such a sinner all my life. Please forgive me. Because he knew he was at the end of his days. And he died soon after. But I know one thing. I will be with him when, I, when life is over for me. And let me tell you. Did you ever call on Jesus to save you? Let me ask you the question. If you were to die right now, right now, are you 100% sure that you will be in the presence of Jesus and live in heaven for all eternity. Are you sure of that? You say, well, I have my religion. I'm a good person. I do good deeds. They're all good. But you know what? If you rely on that to go to heaven, you will never make it there. Not according to the Bible. Not my words, the Bible. The Bible says you must believe in Jesus. You must ask forgiveness of your sin in order for him to forgive you. Don't die without Jesus. You need him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you.